Good morning, Parkdale Grace Fellowship. Uh, welcome, church family. Um, and we are here this morning in an almost empty uh, sanctuary, but speaking to uh, many of you who are scattered all over this city. It has been two weeks now since most of us have been able to gather together. And uh, we are just praying, trusting the Lord that this uh, means of communicating online will be a, a, a point of contact just to help you feel that you are, are not quite so separated and scattered. Uh, I've been contacting by phone uh, many of you, and I haven't quite connected with all of you, some by phone, some by text, some email. And uh, I've been hearing back from many of you, and praise the Lord, I have not yet heard of anyone from our congregation who is sick with this flu, and we thank the Lord for that. Uh, however, there's uh, probably about 20 uh, that I have heard of so far who have lost their jobs, and uh, many others whose hours have been cut back. So that is uh, a concern and an area that I encourage um, Let's all be praying for one another in this time, praying for just that uh, comfort, uh, that sense of peace and confidence that the Lord will provide. Uh, let's pray for his provision in the lives of, of our church family. I want to encourage us this morning to especially be um, praying for our missionaries. Uh, we've got missionaries who are part of this family, who are scattered around the world, and uh, right now, because of this pandemic, uh, they cannot come home if they, if they wanted to. They are stranded. Uh, we trust they are stranded where God wants them and where God will use them. Uh, but they don't have family, and they don't have the support networks that we have here. And so we need to uphold them in prayer, particularly at this time. Uh, I have spoken to our board and have asked that the board would uh, in any cutbacks and, and uh, reductions that are necessary, that the board would cut anything and everything but our missionaries. Uh, we need to stand there for them. And so uh, let's uphold them in prayer. And um, this morning we are going to uh, just take some time to, to pray. And uh, Lord, I just thank you that we have a God who loves us, a God who is in control, a God who knows the end from the beginning, a God who is working through this pandemic, uh, purposes that are unknown to us, but you are working for your glory and you are working for the good of your people. You are working for the salvation of souls and that there might be joy in the hearts of many who do not know you today. And Lord, it is, it is uh, something that we confess that so often uh, the heart of man does not turn to God until we have nowhere left to turn. Uh, Lord, forgive us when we use you as a last resort when you should be the first place that we turn to. I pray this morning for the strengthening of your church family. I pray for the unifying and the uniting of our hearts uh, through Jesus Christ. Lord, though we are scattered, I pray that we would be united in you and that we would sense that unity, that we would sense that we are part of the body of Christ, part of your family. Lord, I pray that there would be a sense and awareness of your presence. And for those that are feeling fearful and alone, that there would be just that confidence that my God is with me and he will never leave me. Lord, you are a friend that stays closer than a brother. We do pray for those who are uh, out of employment and wondering how are their needs going to be met. Oh, Lord, let this be a time uh, of proving that our God is faithful, a time when you show yourself on their behalf to be all that they need. Lord, we trust you to meet the needs of our church family. 
We call upon you for the, the safety and the protection of, of our congregation from uh, this, uh, this pandemic, this virus. Lord, we pray for uh, our health care workers on the front lines, and we ask for your protection on their lives. We pray for our politicians and leaders who are dealing with this the best that they can. Lord, that, that their eyes would be turned to you. We pray that they would sense and acknowledge and humbly confess their need of, of someone greater than themselves. And Lord, I pray that that you would give them wisdom, guard them from being mere puppets in the hands of the enemy. But Lord, I pray that your spirit would be directing their decisions. Lord, we uh, do pray for our missionaries and ask for your uh, blessing on their lives. We pray that you would encourage their hearts, that you would give them confidence that they are not alone. We pray, Father, that you would cause this to be a fruitful time in their ministry, that it would be a time of their own uh, growing deep with you and growing in the grace of God. And Lord, we just ask now your blessing upon your word as it goes forth. We pray that it would give insight, that it would give direction, encouragement, comfort, and hope, that our faith would be built up by the ministry of your spirit through the word of God. And I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. If you would uh, open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. Matthew 25. And this morning we are going to be looking at verses 31 through 46 and uh, asking the question, how do we live in perilous times? Uh, we, we need the Lord to, to show us um, more than just how to keep safe from the virus, how to not catch it. Uh, that can too easily become our focus and our preoccupation. There is a much grander thing that God desires for us than avoiding the virus. So let's begin reading Matthew 25 and verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from before the foundation of the world. Sorry, from, be from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, 
but the righteous into eternal life. It was during the, the plagues that struck the Roman Empire in the second and third centuries AD, uh, the early part of church history, that Christians were known for their extraordinary courage and their acts of love. While every Roman with the ability to do so was evacuating and fleeing for their lives from the city of Rome, Christians from the surrounding communities all around were going against the flow and rushing into the city of Rome, into the epicenter of the plague to care for the elderly and the many sick who had been abandoned. Eusebius, the historian, records saying all day long the Christians tended to the dying and to their burial, countless numbers of desperate souls with no one to care for them. The Christians gathered together from all parts of the city a multitude of those who were starving and brought them together and distributed bread to them. In the minds of many ancient Romans, it was the fearlessness of the Christians, the love that was shown by the Christians during the plagues that ravished so much of the land. Uh, it was this love and this different spirit, different heart, different nature that proved to them the truth of their religion. And it resulted in many putting their faith in Jesus Christ. Historically, we Christians have been at our very best during times of plague and sickness, and the world has taken notice. The value of our faith is demonstrated in times of crisis and difficulty. Now is such a time. Let us arise and shine. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Look uh, back one chapter in Matthew to chapter 24 and verse 44. Jesus speaking, and he says, Therefore, you also be ready. Be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. As a church, we know that the coming of the Lord can't be far away. Our study of prophecy has shown that the signs are all coming together. His, his return must be very soon. But what does it look like for us to be ready for the coming of our Lord? How do we know that we are ready? It's not a theological exam that we must pass to be ready, though we have to know our theology. That's important. But being ready is not having our end times prophecy figured out. How should we be living in these last days as perilous times are increasing around the world? And I'm speaking to us as Christians. If you are not a Christian, the first step of getting ready is putting your faith in Jesus Christ. You need to be a child of God because he is coming for his own. And if you are not a child of God, he's not coming for you. But as a Christian, anticipating his return, we want to be found ready when he returns. What will that look like? The next two verses in chapter 24 of Matthew shed some light on this question. Matthew 24, verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? In other words, who then is ready? Whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season. To give them food in due season is to provide for their needs. This can be both physical sustenance and spiritual provision. Providing for the physical needs, providing for their spiritual needs. Both are, 
are uh, included in this thinking. In verse 46, blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Has our master given us the, the call, the commission to, to feed, to provide for the sustenance, to provide for, minister to, build up, encourage, nurture? Yes, he has. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. And when we get to Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31, this section that we've just read is not a parable. It is a prophetic declaration of exactly what is going to happen at the second coming of Christ when he judges the nations at the end of the great tribulation. It's not a parable. This is going to happen. We are going to take a look at this passage because it gives us great insight into what kinds of actions are evidence of people of God who are ready for their master's return. So verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. This prophecy describes a period of time at the end of the great tribulation after Jesus returns in great power and great glory to this earth, and he has defeated the armies of the world that have gathered against him at Armageddon, and he has cast Satan into the bottomless pit, and the Antichrist and the false prophet have been cast into the lake of fire, and now Jesus is ready to set up his kingdom on earth. However, there are still many unbelievers on earth, and they cannot have any part in his new kingdom. So in this passage in Matthew 25, verse 31 to 46, Jesus is separating those who will be part of his kingdom and those who will be cast into hell. Some of them he will say, enter in, and to many others he will uh, say, depart from me. And verse 32, all the nations, or it can be translated all the Gentiles from all over the world, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Who are these nations? Who are these Gentiles from all over the world? Keep in mind the timing. This is taking place at the end of the Great Tribulation, and Jesus is just about to set up his kingdom on earth. So these are all non-Jewish people, the nations. They are the non-Jewish people who remain on the earth after all the devastation of the great tribulation, after all the outpouring of God's wrath upon the earth, after all the, uh, the, the work of the Antichrist and the, and the wars and the devastation of plagues. And, and after all of that, there are still people who have survived to the end. And all the nations refers to all the surviving Gentiles still alive on earth after the tribulation is ended. Joel chapter 3 verses 1 to 2 uh, reinforces this identity. Notice that as Jesus separates the Gentiles, uh, there are two types of Gentiles, two types among the nations that are identified. One group is, is uh, compared to sheep, and the other group is compared to goats. Sheep and goats are entirely different species uh, with entirely different natures. Believers, believers in Jesus Christ are always referred to as sheep, never as goats. Believers are intrinsically different in nature from unbelievers. We have become like our master who is called the Lamb of God. A believer is not 
like an unbeliever in every way except they're forgiven. No, we have received a whole new nature. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Satan, on the other hand, is portrayed in Satanism, witchcraft, the occult, as a goat. And therefore, it is fitting that those who belong to him, those who share in his, his nature, are described as goats. And so obviously, these sheep that we are looking at are Gentiles who came to faith in Christ after the rapture of the church. Um, they were not believers at the time of the rapture. Otherwise, they would have been taken from the earth with the believers. And even if the lost don't believe us while we are here, even if you have lost loved ones that don't believe and their heart is hardened, uh, persevere in giving them the gospel. Uh, get literature out to people. Uh, if they've heard from us the gospel and they have seen in us the love of Christ, though they may not yet put their faith in, in Christ, they may come to faith after the church is gone. They may come to faith when they see the horrors of God's wrath coming upon this earth. But what a horrible time that will be to be alive on earth after the church is gone. Far better to recognize that now is the day of salvation and put your faith in Jesus Christ now. We read on in Matthew 25, verse 33. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Notice that word, inherit. That clearly indicates that the kingdom that they are privileged to enter into and to enjoy was not earned by their good works. But it is the benefit of their relationship to the father, the benefit of their relationship to the king. And notice also that from the very beginning, the Father had prepared the kingdom for them. Life in the kingdom is going to be like is going to be life on earth, like God originally intended it to be from the beginning. The kingdom is going to be what God from the beginning intended for man to live in. Before it was spoiled uh, by sin, he's going to restore his perfect creation. And what follows in, the, in the, the next verses is not a list of the good things that these believers did to earn the right to enter the kingdom. No, the Bible is crystal clear that no one can earn salvation by doing good works. It is only by trusting in the grace of God to save you that anyone can be saved. But the Bible also makes it crystal clear that if anyone does put their faith in Jesus Christ to save them from their sin, that they will be born again and their nature will be changed from being a child of Satan, a goat, to being a child of God, a sheep, a change of nature. This is why Jesus uses in this uh, goats and sheep. They're different creatures. There's different nature. However, the Bible, uh, uh, look at Ephesians chapter 2, sorry. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Just because you might be at home in your easy chair doesn't mean you can't look this up in the Bible. I invite you to open your Bibles with me. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For it is by grace that you have been saved. Let's repeat that. For it is by grace that you have been saved. That means it is God's work. It is God's doing. 
You've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The Bible's clear on that. However, the Bible declaration doesn't stop there in verse 9. It continues in verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are saved by grace through faith. It is a gift of God. It is not of our works, our salvation, our new nature, but we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The foundation of our salvation, uh, our, our foundation that we stand upon, our new nature, the change that has come about in us, has come by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and the fruit of our salvation, what this change produces in us is good works, Christ-likeness. It is good works that provide evidence of the faith. James chapter 2 is crystal clear in teaching this. Now the Lord proceeds back in Matthew 25 to uh, describe the good works, the, the fruit of these sheep, Christians, the good works that give evidence that these truly are sheep and not goats. They are truly righteous children of God and not unrighteous children of Satan. We read in verse 35. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him. You can imagine a little perplexity in their face. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you, or... When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The implication in their response is that these righteous Gentiles fed a lot of hungry people, but they don't remember feeding Jesus. They took in many strangers and visited many sick and many in prison, but they don't remember seeing Jesus before. And they're sure they would recognize that face. In verse 40, And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Now we are made aware of a, of a group of people standing there referred to as these, my brethren. Who are they? The Bible tells us that during the tribulation, the most fiercely persecuted people on the earth will be the Jews and followers of Jesus Christ. So Jesus could be referring to either of these groups. By speaking to a group of believing Gentiles, so it would seem likely that perhaps most in, in focus is the, the Jews and the Jews were not Christians. Um, and so these sheep had taken in some who, who weren't their own. Whether they were Jews or Christians doesn't change the story here. Um, the Bible, or, or G Jesus has united himself spiritually with us. When he says, inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Uh, what does he mean there? Jesus lives in us. He has united his spirit with us. He is one with us. 
Christ is in us and we are in Christ. He knows what we are going through. He shares our trials. He shares our suffering. He feels your hurt. He understands your fears. He is in you and one with you. And Jesus said, assuredly or truly, meaning this isn't just a sentimental metaphor. It's not just poetic language that Jesus is using. He is speaking reality. Assuredly, truly, certainly, this, this is true. I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Not in as much as you did it to the pastor or in as much as you did it to the spiritual leaders, but to the least of these. That means what you do to those who are severely handicapped, to those who have no fixed address, to those who, have, who are uneducated, those that no one else likes, rejected by everyone else. But because they are the chosen of God, in as much as you do it unto them, you do it unto Christ. Now let's review point by point the list that Jesus went through of what these believing Gentiles had done that gave evidence that they were children of God. And keep in mind that these are things that they did in times of great crisis. These are things that they did during the great tribulation. These are things that they did at risk to their lives. And keep in mind that the actions Jesus is drawing attention to are actions he identifies as being characteristic of sheep, characteristic of believers. It is normal behavior for a Christian that Jesus is identifying here. Also remember that they are putting their lives at risk to do these things. There will come a point in the great tribulation which lies yet ahead. Uh, what we are experiencing is just the beginning of building up to uh, unbelievable horrors that are to come. And there's coming a point when a man called the Antichrist will turn violently against all Jews. He will be the, the ruler of the world. Um, he will have the world under his control and he will turn in violence against all Jews and against all who put their faith in Christ. And he will drive them underground into hiding if he can't kill them first. In Revelation chapter 13, verses 15 to 17, are a passage that just give us a glimpse into some of the conditions that these sheep were living through and that they were uh, acting under these kinds of conditions. Revelation 13, verse 15, he, that is the Antichrist, was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So there's coming a time when there's going to be this image, and if you don't worship it, you will be put to death. Verse 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So if you don't worship this beast, you don't get the mark. And if you don't have the mark, you can't buy, you can't sell, you can't do business, you can't go into a store and get something, you can't uh, barter and trade with anyone, you can't do it, anything, without this mark. Under these circumstances, 
and the prevailing evil of satanic hatred of God on the earth at that time, anyone who would befriend or feed someone who did not have the mark would be putting their own life at, at risk. The implication is that many of the Jews do not have the mark, and the Christians do not have the mark. Verse, 20, er, verse 35, back in Matthew chapter 25. Jesus said, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. So these that Jesus is speaking to are Gentile believers who did not take the mark of the beast. They are living secret. They are under the radar, trying to avoid detection. They couldn't buy food themselves. So what they have for food was very difficult and risky to come by. It's meager, and it is very valuable to them. They don't know if they will be able to find more food tomorrow. But when they come across a Jew or a fellow follower of Jesus Christ who was hungry, who was at risk of losing their own, they were at, at the risk of losing their own lives, they would share their, their meager provision with the other. Their behavior was consistent with the early Christians of Rome who risked their own lives to go into that plague-infested city that they might feed the poor and care for the needy. As perilous times around us increase and fearful people selfishly stockpile food for themselves, let us be living true to our different nature, our new nature, and be looking for those in need whom we can serve. What if you don't have enough for yourself and them? The Bible teaches us to give what you have, trusting the Lord to uh, multiply. Remember the, the widow uh, who had just enough for one meal for, for her son and herself. They were going to eat it, and then they were going to die. And Elijah the prophet said, feed me first, and God will provide. And he did. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Luke 6, 38. And Jesus said, Give, and it will be given to you. Starts with give, and then it comes back to you. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. That means what you give, uh, whatever comes back will be of the same measure, but it's going to be pushed down tight, shaken till there's no room, put more in, pushed down tight, shaken, put more in, pushed down tight, sh tight, shaken, and given back to you. The promise is give and you will receive. That is the way of our Lord. There are many testimonies throughout history of Christians who have functioned by this principle, Christians who at great expense and cost to themselves have given, and they have found it true that God is no man's debtor. God is faithful. We read on in Matthew 25, the last part of verse 35, I was a stranger, and you took me in. child of God recognizes that I'm not my own. I gave him my life when he saved me. And I am now his. And all that I have is his. To be used for his glory. And in times of crisis like this, followers of Jesus have always been characterized by their glad willingness to share their precious resources with others in need. That has marked Christians down through the ages of history. And as these birth pangs intensify all around us, 
leading into the, the tribulation, there will be a growing number of people in need. Increasingly, in days to come, there may be refugees fleeing danger or those who have lost their home or have been driven out by their family because of their faith and they are in need of a place to stay. Jesus was not talking of opening your door to friends and relatives. That's a given. Even unbelievers will do that. He's talking of opening your door to strangers who are rejected, opening your door to those who are, are marked as there's a bounty on their head, opening your doors to those who doing so too may cost you your life. Look at this amazing description of these righteous Gentiles whom Jesus refers to as sheep. Look at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. And this is referring to tribulation saints, those that came to faith in Christ after the rapture, And verse 11 says, they triumphed over Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Will those of us who have been freed by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross for our sin, who has removed the sting of death, who has removed the power of the grave, who has triumphed over sin and death, to set us free from all of that, will those of us who've been freed from the fear of death take the risks that many in this world will refuse to take and display our hope among the fearful, display our faith among the infected, and display our trust in eternal life among the dying. This is a glorious hour. This is what Jesus calls us to. In Matthew 25 and verse 36. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Horrors, persecutions, so intense that, that people are beaten and stripped naked to, to take their clothes from them. I mean, what context do we find today in which we find people that are naked? There are coming days where that is going to be a common. The Bible prophesies that many widespread plagues are coming. And there will be many sick and many dying with contagious diseases in days to come. And it's happening in the world all around us today already. At the end of those coming days of horror, the Lord reveals that his sheep risked their lives to visit and care for the dying, like their master before them who reached out to the contagious lepers and humbly became obedient even unto death. In the Spanish flu pandemic that battered America in 1918, as conditions worsened, healthcare workers in city after city overwhelmed with the, the load that they could not keep up to the, the sick and the dying, they pleaded for volunteers to help them care for the sick. We could be facing days like that again. And the plea would go out for volunteers to, to come and help care for the sick. In Philadelphia, the head of emergency aid pleaded for help in taking care of sick children. They had all these sick children and no one to, to care for them. Scared, fearful, dying. 
confused and alone, someone needed to love and care for these children. We may see conditions like this in our own country one day soon, where we simply can't just leave it to the professionals. The cry goes out, the need is there, there are no professionals to care for them. If such a time lies ahead for us Christians who have been given power over the fear of death, could be, should be the first ones to step forward. Will we answer that call when it comes? If clinics and hospitals filled and overflowing cannot care for everyone, will we step forward? Who will be there in their final moments of life to tell them of the love of Jesus who offers them salvation from Satan's power and Satan's clutch upon their lives? Who will tell them of the way of escape? That if you just call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, how can they call on the one they have not believed in and how can they believe in the one they have not heard? And how can they hear unless someone preach? And how can they preach unless they are sent? Jesus said, go into all the world and proclaim the good news of the gospel to every creature. And especially when you see them on the brink of passing into a lost eternity. How can we, who have been saved from sin and saved from the power of death, shrink back and say, I might catch the disease? God has given us victory over that. As Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego once said when they were faced with the prospect of being thrown into the fiery furnace, our God is able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't. That needs to be the conviction and the cry of the Christian as we plunge into danger, sent by our master, sending us as sheep among wolves. Our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, to live as Christ, to die is gain. Is that our faith? Is that our conviction? Our future has been secured. Nothing can snatch us from the hands of the Lord. Oh God, that you would give us fearlessness in the face of danger. In 1527, the bubonic plague was ravaging Europe and Martin Luther refused to flee from his town of Wittenberg but he chose to minister to the sick, to support his neighbors, to proclaim the gospel in that community. His reason for doing so was simple and straightforward. He said, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. However, that does not mean that he was foolish or contributed to the spread of the disease either. For Martin Luther writes this, He said, I shall ask God mercifully to protect us, and then I shall help purify the air, administer medicine to others, and take it myself. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order to not become contaminated and thus perchance infect and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. But if my neighbor needs me, I shall not avoid place or person, but will go freely. Was there a cost? Martin Luther did not die of the plague. But there was a price to pay. His daughter caught the plague and she died. But God used him in the process to save many, many others, to help many others, and to support an entire community who saw in Martin Luther the love and the power of Jesus Christ. 
What is our community going to see in us? Lord, fill us with the power of your spirit. Let's read on. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. And on that judgment day, when the sheep and the goats are separated, the sheep have been invited into the kingdom, but then Jesus will say to those on the left hand, the goats, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Let me pause there for just a minute. You look back to verse 34 in contrast to the sheep. He says, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. God prepared this earth, this kingdom for people. It wasn't his desire for people to go to hell. But verse 41 says, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. I was naked, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then panic is rising in their hearts, and they also will answer him saying, Lord, when? When did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? The implication, of course, is if we had known it was you, God, we would have. <laughs> Many will answer them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. You say they were acting according to their nature, enemies of God. If they had known it was God to save their own skin, they would have treated him with some more respect, perhaps. We see lots of these kinds of people all around us. They see the need, but they're not moved. But we have been given a different nature than the world has. We have a different master than the world has. They are afraid to help because they have no savior. They have no eternal security. This world is all that they have and they are clinging fiercely to this world and to their life in it. But for us, this world is not our home. It is our mission field. Jesus never told us to stay safe. But he told us, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Let us be wise. Let us follow wise protocol. But let us not neglect the Lord's brethren and our commission to the lost. Let us recognize they are dying. They are going to a lost eternity. As a church, regularly contact one another by phone, text, email, stay in touch with one another. Make sure that your brothers and sisters in Christ have adequate supplies. Ensure that they have any needed assistance. Check on your neighbors. Check on those around you. Take your eyes off yourself and fix your eyes on the need that's around us. If for any reason you need to enter the home of the sick or needy, do follow proper protocol. First of all, pray. Pray. Wear a mask. Wear gloves. Use sanitizer. Whatever is necessary 
but do not neglect them. To neglect out of fear for our own safety is not an option. That is not the nature that God has given us. That is not the cloth that we are cut out of. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would cause us as a church to arise in such a time as this. Lord, it's not in us, it's not of ourselves, but we have been given a new nature. We are a new creation. We have been filled with the Spirit of God. And it is by your life and by your power and by your Spirit that we live. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you would send us forth in boldness into this world. Lord, using the avenues and the means that we can. But Lord, let us not so love these bodies, this life, that we would shrink back in fear of death. But Lord, may we recognize because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and the salvation that we have entered into, death no longer has victory over us. The grave no longer has any sting. Lord, you are our life, and that can never be taken from us. May we live with this kind of conviction. May we live in a way that communicates to this world that there is so much more to live for than what we see on this planet. Lord God, I pray that we would be found faithful when you return, faithful in proclaiming to the sick and proclaiming to the dying and proclaiming to those all around us the way of salvation, the good news of Jesus Christ, that we would be found faithful in exercising that which you have given us, the life of Christ, and manifesting it, ministering it into those all around us, and especially, Lord, to the brothers and sisters in Christ. And I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you, church. Normally, this is a time when we would gather and pray with one another, a time when we would fellowship together with one another. And so I invite you at this time, take a few moments, pause, Pray for the church. Pray for the needs of the church. And um, you get a chance this afternoon, pick up your phone, grab your text, um, be in touch with brothers and sisters in the church. Uh, pass the greeting around. Let's spend some time in fellowship this afternoon. And the Lord bless you. Um, and we are praying for you. And Lord willing, we're going to, a little later on this week, uh, communicate to you some ways that you can participate in a prayer meeting on Wednesday night. I'm going to try and do that online, and uh, we'll get more information out to you soon. Okay? God bless. Him.